This is nursing care of the child with an alteration in perfusion or a cardiovascular disorder, part one. Uh, so we need to remember those changes that happen from fetal circulation. Uh, remember in utero, oxygenation happens at the placenta, not at the lungs. And so the fetal circulation is designed to bypass the lungs. Just send enough blood to the lungs for growth, not for oxygenation. So it does that through the foramen ovale, and we're going to have right to left shunting of the blood because it's returning from the body, going back to the body. It doesn't need to go to the lungs. Um, it also uses the ductus arteriosus. That's a connection between the two major vessels, between the pulmonary artery and the aorta. Again, blood is going to shunt. We would call it still right to left or from the pulmonary to uh, systemic, so to the aorta, so bypassing the lungs. And here's just kind of a picture remembering where those things are, the foramen ovale here and the ductus arteriosus here between the two major vessels. So some common treatments we use when there's cardiac dysfunction, oxygen. Uh, when you have somebody on oxygen, they should be on a saturation monitor, and you're also going to be monitoring the work of their breathing, the respiratory rate, effort, breath sounds. CPT is used often uh, to break up and mobilize secretion so the child can cough it out. Chest tubes, remember this removes things that are outside the lungs but inside the pleural uh, sac, and stuff in there, whether it's air or blood or fluid, is going to push on the lungs and collapse them. So the chest tube allows the lungs to fully inflate. And then a pacer. Um, we can sometimes need a pacer just temporarily, uh, particularly after cardiac surgery. If there's a little bit of um, swelling that happens, you might need one temporarily, or it may be permanent. But either way, we need to be watching that ECG. So assessment on a kid with a cardiac uh, issue, we're going to get a good health history, find out what's currently going on as well as the past medical history, monitoring their weight. If you're not circulating well, you're not sending enough oxygen and nutrients out to the tissues to grow, to multiply. So we're worried about low weight gain. We're also worried about high weight gain because of um, heart failure are you retaining fluid um, so that sudden weight gain is a concern as well we're going to be looking at the, the skin kids more than adults really show changes in their skin uh, they'll be pale mottled uh, cool um, we have clubbing on their clubbing is the fingers and toes and it takes a good six months of chronic hypoxia to develop clubbing um, but delayed capillary refill, paleness, coolness, um, kids just really show very quickly circulatory problems in their skin. Look at the chest shape. An enlarged heart can make an abnormally shaped chest and listen to the heart tones. And where is the point of maximum impulse? Again, that can tell us this is an enlarged heart because it's not where it should be. And remember when you do an apical pulse, you're supposed to count for one full minute. Uh, we're looking at respiratory rate. If those lungs is where the heart failure is um, filling up fluid, right? We're going to see respiratory distress. We're going to see retractions, increased heart rate, and then uh, peripheral pulses and cap refill. If you're not circulating out to the extremities, those are not going to be normal. So signs and symptoms that a kid has a cardiac disorder. Well, cyanosis, um, edema, uh, clubbing, some of these are infectious and fever can be a sign, retractions, uh, we've got extra fluid in the lungs, prominence of the pericardial chest wall, so abnormally shaped chest there, um, visible or engorged uh, vessels, being able to see abdominal pulsations, abdominal distension. So what are some of the medications we use? Well. Um, if we need to keep that ductus arteriosus open, 
um, so a child is something like transposition of the great arteries. We need to keep it open until surgery. Uh, we're going to put them on prostaglandin. Um, improve, to improve cardiac function, we're going to use uh, digoxin or linoxin, which you're also used to in adults, right? This increases cardiac, cardiac contractility. Uh, it also slows down the heart rate, so our concern is to slow it down too much. We use your angiotensin converting enzymes, ACE inhibitors, uh, for hypertension and beta adrenergic blockers, beta blockers, which also uh, are for hypertension, decreasing the rate as well as the force. Sometimes after a heart surgery, we do want to keep the pressures low. We don't want a lot of pressure on that new surgical site in the heart. So um, that's usually when we're going to be using those. And then removing extra fluid, our diuretics. And remember, furosemide, its uh, brand name is Lasix. That's a loop diuretic, really effective, but it wastes potassium. Spirolactone, uh, also called aldactone, uh, is does not waste potassium. So often you'll see they'll use both of these in low doses rather than um, getting high on the, the furosemide where we're worried about electrolytes. So when you do have a child on digoxin, you're going to do an apical pulse before giving it, and an apical pulse is one full minute. You're probably used to the holding rate being 60, which is true for an adult. For an older child, it's 70. So if the rate is 70 or less, we do not give it. For an infant, usually the doctor will write us um, parameters. But even if no parameters are written, 90 to 110 would be the holding rate for an infant. A sleeping infant, probably 90. A crying infant, maybe a, you know, 110 is more reasonable there. Um, again, most of the time there will be a written number though. So when we uh, are giving digoxin, our concern is toxicity, right? And the early signs of toxicity, digoxin toxicity or nausea and vomiting anorexia right kids get this all the time they just don't feel good um, so bradycardia and that's why we're checking that and then dysrhythmias uh, with digoxin you're supposed to always check the med with another nurse and this is a drug we've got to do drug levels and we want that between 0 0.8 and 2 we also need to monitor potassium levels, though, because usually these kids are also on Lasix, which wastes potassium. Low potassium lowers that toxic level. So um, a child can be toxic at two, where that usually falls within the therapeutic range. Cardiac catheterizations. These can be done to diagnose a problem, but they can also be done to treat a problem. So they can be diagnostic or interventional. Uh, when we do one, the things we're watching for is bleeding. We've punctured a major vessel, so acute hemorrhage, um, low-grade fever, infection, right? Nausea and vomiting, especially if they use uh, contrast medium. Some people react poorly to that. Uh, decreased pulse in the catheterized extremity. That vessel that we've we've cannulated could swell a little bit and especially if it was an arterial um, catheter we can get decreased pulse and then um, transient dysrhythmias we put something into the heart and let it bump around in there it just irritates things so we can see um, some dysrhythmias afterwards rare but serious um, complications are to have a stroke seizures cardiac tamponade or death so here's what we do with the, the heart catheter, right? And they'll call them right or left sided, which is not where you put it in. You have an artery and a vein in both femoral sides, in both. Um, I know adults, they use arms a lot. Kids, they probably use femoral more often. So right or left is which side of the heart you're threading it into. If you are threading it into the right side of the heart, that's up a vein. Um, if you're threading it into the left side of the heart, you're coming up through the artery around the aortic arch. Right. 
So realize there's femoral veins on both sides, femoral arteries on both sides. So just which side it's on is not what the right or left means. It's which side of the heart did you go into. In adults, they're usually trying to do this, right? Thread it around that aortic arch to check the coronary vessels. We are usually looking inside the heart for structural anomalies um, rather than at the, the coronary vessels. So we're going to move on to the defects. Um, but I want to first just give some key concepts to think about whenever you're thinking about hemodynamics. Realize blood is going to move from where it's at high pressure to low pressure. It's not going to go where it's hard. It's going to go where it's easy, which means it's going to take the path of least resistance. Now, things that change that resistance is both the size of the vessel it's going through and the volume. And you know this from your garden hose. If you think about it, you just have water dribbling out the end of the garden hose. You have two choices to increase that pressure. You can put your thumb over the end, make the volume smaller. So same amount of flow in a smaller volume, and now it squirts out at higher pressure. Your other option is to turn the amount of water up. And now, because a lot's coming, it comes at a higher pressure, right? So if you just think about that, you're a straw versus a garden hose. You can fit a lot more through the garden hose than you can through the straw. So to get the same amount through the straw, you've got to either move it through way faster or with a lot more pressure. Okay, shunting. Uh, you're going to hear this term a lot, right to left versus left to right shunts. That just means which way the blood moved across the defect in the heart. So from the left side of the heart to the right, our left to right shunt. So we took blood that from the lungs into the left side of the heart, moved it back to the right side of the heart, back to the lungs. This is often used to be, the old term was to call it an acyanotic defect uh, because we're not sending deoxygenated blood out to the body. The problem with that is cyanosis is a color. And sometimes these kids can develop quite a bit of heart failure and actually look fairly cyanotic. Um, so that's not a great way to describe it. So left to right shunt is more accurate. A right to left shunt means blood returning from the body comes to the right side of the heart, crosses to the left side of the heart, does not go to the lungs, and goes back out to the body. So on these kids, we are going to see a lower O2 saturation because we're taking desaturated blood and sending it back to the body without letting it get saturated with oxygen in the lungs. Um, some of these kids actually look quite pink, which is why that calling it a cyanotic defect wasn't very accurate. Uh, some the things we're trying to do when we have a child with a defect um, is to lower the cardiac demands. Their heart is not good at pumping blood in the amounts that their body needs. So let's not do things that raise that amount. Uh, so limited physical activities. We let them color. We don't let them run around on the play yard. Uh, preserving body temperature, right? You raise that temperature, you raise your metabolic needs. They're not meeting it as it is. Treat infections early and aggressively, keeping them upright, working on um, the best venous return we can. And if they're really irritable, we're going to sedate them. Crying and fighting raises their metabolism. And then we're going to do everything we can to improve uh, tissue oxygenation. Think about your orders though. If we have a right to left shunt, putting extra oxygen into the lungs does nothing because that blood is not going to the lungs, right? It's returning from the body, going back to the body. So that is not helpful on those kids. Um, or there's a very limited return. You may be able to, to a sm tiny bit may be helpful, but any more than that will do nothing beyond what a small amount did.